Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our panel discussion focused on the developer journey from PC and console to mobile. I'm Ranjod Mathial, a strategic partner manager on Google Play. I will be your moderator for our panel discussion. I'm excited to share that we have a diverse panel of game developers for this session who are eager to share their journey of bringing their best games from PC console to mobile. We hope to inspire other PC and console developers from the learnings of their early struggles and successes in expanding to the mobile platform. Before we introduce today's panel, I'd like to share a few key stats that highlight the importance of expanding your game to mobile and building for additional form factors. Today, there are over 3 billion monthly active devices worldwide on Android. What an astounding number. Additionally, when it comes to Google Play, there are over 2 billion monthly active users. Android continues to be a vibrant ecosystem with Google Play at the heart. What these numbers show us is that the opportunity to bring your best games from PC and console to mobile in order to grow your games, build your fandom, tell your stories, and reach more gamers across the globe has never been more important and equally enticing. In fact, New Zoo's Global Games Market Report for April forecasts that the overall games market will surpass 200 billion in revenue by the year 2023, easily surpassing 2021 forecasts of 175 billion. Mobile will be an important piece of that growth as it is estimated that mobile will account for over 50% of that revenue. What this means is that we think there has never been a better time or opportunity for our developer partners to be excited about expanding form factors by bringing your biggest games from PC and console to mobile. We've already seen many developers take this journey. This slide gives a snapshot of a few of many that have launched high quality games with huge success across platforms, bringing their best games across device form factors. Speaking of high quality games, today we're going to highlight three particular developers that have taken the complex journey of bringing some of their best games from PC and console to mobile. Earlier this March, Wizards of the Coast launched Magic the Gathering Arena, bringing the excitement around all things magic to mobile. Their journey is just getting started, but I'm super excited to see what else they have in store. Riot Games has already launched multiple titles on mobile, from Legend of Runeterra and Team Fight Tactics, and most recently, bringing League of Legends Wild Rift to gamers on mobile. And finally, 2K, which actually has been on mobile since 2013, has also leaned more into mobile, including bringing NBA 2K, a game with decades of history, one of my all-time favorite games, to my phone. I now like to welcome today's panel consisting of leadership from each of these developers to share their developer journey on the early struggles and successes of expanding their games to mobile. First, we have the executive producer of Wizards of the Coast, Chris Kale. Next, we have executive producer of League of Legends, Wild Rift, Michael Chow. And finally, the VP and head of mobile at 2K, Tyler Nation. Chris, Michael, Tyler, Thank you for being here today. Let's kick things off with a brief intro. Hey everyone, I'm Michael Chow, executive producer for Wild Rift at Riot Games. Um, I've been making smartphone games for, <laughs> I think, longer than it was responsible to do so. Uh, I started in 2007 before there were actually any app stores. I remember my first time starting to make games for Android when the Nexus One was given out as an all access pass reward for GDC in 2000, it must have been 2009 or 2010. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Tyler Nation. Uh, I grew up in the Bay Area and in the East Bay, I grew up playing sports. Uh, I transitioned from sports into, from one game, uh, playing it into actually making games, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, through the years, I've, I've had the privilege of working at Scopely, helping them scale from seed through series A. Um, and for the last three and a half years, I've been at 2K rebooting the mobile publishing business and kind of growing it from zero to one. And um, I'm incredibly excited to be here with you guys and to, to dive into some interesting questions. Hey, everybody. My name is Chris Kao. I'm the executive producer at Wizards of the Coast. 
working for first party development, which includes Magic the Gathering Arena. I've been making lifestyle games for a long time, mostly MMOs, long before there were live service or lifestyle games. And occasionally I've brought them to mobile. So unlike a lot of uh, the folks here, I come to mobile bringing it to uh, the audience that's out there and bringing them the lifestyle game that they enjoy. And that's what the phone is for us on Arena, another place to play wherever and whenever you want. I'd like to kick off this discussion with a focus on the mindset and steps taken prior to embarking on your journey to mobile. I'd love to hear from each of you on the motivation for bringing your titles to mobile. Perhaps also share it for the audience. How long have you been on the platform? I've been sort of working on the mobile MOBA for eight years. From my perspective, the dream of the mobile MOBA has escaped a lot of great game developers for a really, really long time which is tough because the business case is obvious. You just take the largest PC genre in the world, which is MOBA, and you bring it to the largest gaming platform in the world, which is mobile. So the business case is obvious, but the, 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 challenge, the challenge at Riot in particular is that Riot is not typically motivated by obvious business cases, um, especially because it wasn't clear for a really long time uh, that it was even physically possible to bring League of Legends to mobile in a way that we were going to be proud of. Um, that we thought was going to be worthy of players' love and investment. Um, but that mission, that dream, uh, has always been powerful enough that it kept us trying over and over again over the course of many years. And it was only after a few really critical breakthroughs that we felt like the time was right. But sort of the core mindset was, what is the player promise? Rather than the business case, what's the player promise of bringing a MOBA or League of Legends in particular to mobile? And the answer is, if we can make a MOBA or we can make League of Legends a better fit for more parts of your day, more phases of your life, and more of the people that you care about, then we'll have created magical disruptive player value that just didn't exist in the world. And that promise of bringing games to more parts of your day, more phases of your life, and more of the people you care about, that's a very mobile, like that's deeply ingrained, I think, in the platform itself. But it's not always obvious how to get there with a particular game franchise or genre. And so that, that was so really trying to figure out how we do that in a way that was really authentic. Um, took us a really long time to figure out. Tyler? Yeah, no, uh, Ranjo, thanks so much for having me. 2K has been in the mobile space since uh, about 2013. Prior to, to joining, one of our wholly owned developers, Cat Daddy, launched a game called WW Supercard. It's going into its eighth season overall. It's number two in the world in terms of card battle games on mobile and art mount. It's number one in the world in terms of lifetime revenue for WWE product on mobile. So that's a little bit about 2K's history on mobile. We've also brought NBA 2K to mobile, and we also brought NBA 2K Arcade to a platform a month ago. It's number one on that platform, and we're really proud of it. You know, I joined back in mid-2017. I was at Scopely prior, and the mission ultimately was uh, 2K has incredible IP. Take-Two has incredible IP as well, a big treasure trove of IP. And really there wasn't much being done with it on mobile outside of WW Supercard. So the journey for the last three and a half years has been a really exciting one. I've had the honor and privilege to build out a team. We started with a couple of people. We're now up to about 50 people. We're supporting a few games that are live in terms of live services. And we've got a few games that we're developing with some of our beloved IP with some developers we're really, really excited about. So. Yeah, uh, the journey for 2K, you know, got started a little late compared to say some of the other companies out there, but we're picking up steam. We have great leadership in place across all the pillars and we're incredibly excited to keep delivering product and bring some new products to the world over the next year. Thanks, Tyler. Super excited on my end. NBA 2K is one of my favorite games, so excited to see that be on the phone now. Chris, same question for you. I'd love to hear what Wizards of the Coast uh, motivation has been with your recent launch in March of uh, Magic the Gathering Arena. Yeah, thank you. I th think the key here is that Wizards is probably a little different than the other groups because it's a paper tabletop company that is really emerging into digital now. And in fact, Arena sort of opened the door and was the pioneering effort. And now we're sort of in charge of the digital for uh, Wizards as well as Hasbro at large. And so Arena was one of those obvious ideas that was very hard to execute because the game is so deep that has so much dimension to it. And 
everybody wanted to make a great digital version of Magic. And we had duels before us, and we had uh, Magic the Gathering online. But all of these didn't necessarily play to what the current market is and the current players want. So we built Magic Arena really with one end goal in mind, which is what you get on your phone now, which is a little icon that says Magic. So while we call it Arena, it's the same game. It's what we call standard Magic. And that's the same on tabletop when you pick up cards, when you play on PC or when you play on mobile. And so that through line, that single hobby that you can kind of pick up anywhere and play in all these different ways, that was the heart of the motivation was just making what we knew was fun and what players loved more broadly accessible. And of course, the phone is table stakes in these attention economy these days. So we wanted to be there. We just had to figure out how to fit the world's most complex game on a kind of small screen. But uh, yeah, our motivation has always been that love of bringing magic to everybody. Absolutely. I love the platform parody in that you're able to keep the game consistent regardless whether it's on the table, you know, on PC or on mobile. So super excited to have magic on board now. Michael, I'd like to ask you in particular, uh, you know, what are some major concerns Riot had when bringing its established IP and games to the mobile platform? How did Riot overcome these concerns and hurdles prior to launch? It really wasn't clear at Riot that we could bring League of Legends to mobile in a way that we would be proud of, that we thought was going to be worthy of our players' love and time and investment. There's three or four really key challenges. The first is, how do we realize what we call league moments on mobile? It's basically that incredibly deep mechanical, I guess mechanical depth and heroic outplay potential that is just that's really core to League of Legends and core to League of Legends as an eSport. Um, can we get moment to moment gameplay feel the way that we that we we believe that League of Legends gameplay needs to feel and needs to be a skill differentiating so that the best players in the world and the best teams in the world are the ones that win. It's not a very straightforward question. And then we have, how do we, so separate from the moment to moment gameplay, how do we get that, that sort of zoomed out high level strategic team play that's critical to League of Legends to work on mobile? And that's the sort of thing that differentiates great players versus extraordinary teams and championships. Third would be, uh, how do we make sure that this stays compatible with how players engage with their mobile devices? And this is one I, I personally was challenged with for a while. Um, when I first started working on mobile MOBA as an opportunity space, the common wisdom was that we couldn't make players concentrate on their mobile phones for more than two minutes at a time. Um, and we sort of rejected that notion, but it took a really long time for us to play that out. And we shot really low at the outset. We said five minutes. Okay, how can we make sure, like, how, how can we overcome this gigantic risk that players aren't going to want to spend more than five minutes concentrating on one thing on their phones? Uh, and it turns out, actually, that bar is more like 15 to 20 minutes, which gives you a lot more breadth and depth to play with as a game developer. But yeah, that was a really critical hurdle for us. Those are three product challenges. I will say... Also, a very existential challenge for a lot of, of developers is figuring out how do we make our players know that our mission um, is real and, and understand it and have it resonate with them as truly and, and deeply as it does for us and to love that mission the way that we love it. I think that really working to communicate directly with our players and overcome that hurdle, uh, I think, has been... has been a really tough challenge that we we wanted to make sure we got right um uh, along the way yeah i love that uh attention to detail here and uh really focusing in on the players here tyler I, i'd love to hear if either you or or um chris if either one of you had similar challenges if not you know i'd love to hear what are some of the challenges that you've experienced Sure. yeah so uh, i think one of the first challenges is growing a mobile business in uh, a company that's been console and PC focused brings its own challenges. And I'll, I'll dive into the trust building process there in terms of uh, bringing IP um, that's so beloved on console and PC and doing it justice on mobile. But I would say our, our focus on my team really is being data informed. So there's a lot of user research that actually happens before 
we even kick off development. There's art testing that kicks off before we get into development. Um, and we talk to the fan base and uh, kick around ideas, feature sets, et cetera, and, and really make sure that we think we've, we've um, turned over every rock before we start even uh, coding the game um, out the gate. Then, of course, there's soft launch. So that's where we work with you guys at Google to effectively test retention numbers, monetization numbers, and understand are we above par, are we in the middle, are we below par in some of these smaller countries, and really kind of iterate, tweak, and make sure that we get it right before bringing a product worldwide. And then finally, I spoke about building trust up front. That's been an incredibly important process for my team overall, is, is to create relationships with the IP holders, with the creators of this IP, and to really deeply understand the core tenets of that IP and make sure that it translates over so that our fan base is really excited when they just jump onto a new platform. And that's how we look at mobile. It's, it's a powerful platform that, that's fully arrived with 5G and with incredibly powerful hardware. I think there's a, a lot of exciting opportunities ahead of us in, in cross-platform across the board. And you know you have to think about play session link that was mentioned earlier. But um, yeah, that's that's been... That's been kind of the journey for my team over the last three and a half years at, at 2K and Take Two. Yeah, it's great to it's great to be able to sit here and listen to Michael and Tyler because I think we all share the common theme of trust, right? Especially when you're dealing with big IPs and saying to players, hey, this is gonna be not just a quality experience, this is gonna be an experience you can fall in love with and that keeps that love of your IP going, right? That's sort of the the heart and the soul of it. But like Tyler was mentioning, you also need to make sure it's gonna work as a business or as a product. And like Michael was saying, you gotta make sure that transliteration or translation is really legitimate. And I think that's a lot of the same challenges that we faced when we were making Arena. First off, there had been other digital efforts before, and while they were fun to play Magic, they actually weren't literal transliterations. So you couldn't play with your cards and then go play on the phone or on the PC the same. And that's very important to players. That was sort of the number one thing we had was that legitimacy. But at the same time, we realized that if it wasn't fast and it wasn't fun, it wouldn't fit into people's lives. But we didn't try to change the rules of magic. What we tried to do was automate a lot of stuff for people. We have an auto tap system that some people still curse because every once in a while it gets something wrong. We have uh, sort of automatic phase passing. We have a full control that you can go into if you really want to get you know nitty gritty. But overall, we wanted to really sort of accelerate that play so that magic was just more fun. And then when it got to the phone, it fit into people's lives, right? And we did all of that through a series of betas and being live on PC and Mac first. And that let us build the trust with our community because they wanted a legitimate competitive form of the magic experience that they could practice with digitally, go to the table and have those skills directly switch across. And initially it was hard to get people to believe we could make magic be so quick, but so legitimate. I remember we were talking with our community about 10 minute games of magic and they were just blown away. They said, there's no way that's gonna happen. Right now there's you know six or seven games of minute games of magic playing. There's also hour long, right? Because you can direct challenge your friends, you can play best of three, you can draft. Like that legitimacy plus that accessibility for the core fans and for the new fans to magic, I believe we hit a lot of success there, but we wouldn't have been able to do it if we hadn't had those challenges to overcome, right? If we'd just been making it from whole cloth, it's not quite the same thing as meeting the expectations that are already there, which I'm sure Michael and Tyler had to do themselves too. Now, having been on mobile, let's shift the focus to the learning since launch. So we'll kick it off with you again here, Tyler. Uh, what has launching your game on mobile done for your title? It's a big question. There's a lot of games being developed uh, at, at 2K and Take Two. I would say first off, uh, someone on my team uh, mentioned a crazy stat that was announced at Google I.O. There's 3 billion Android devices that are, are activated worldwide, which is just absolutely incredible. Um, you see a product like WWE Supercard, I want to say we're at 24 million um, downloads, some 23, 24 million downloads lifetime over the life of that title. Um, and you know that benefits what we do on console at WWE 2K. We get to reach this fan base on on a mobile platform um, like like Google. Uh, and yeah, ultimately, it's I think it's been a, a really positive thing for the brand. And something Michael Chow touched on earlier, which is key, is the most important thing is to launch a great product. 
So at the end of the day, something 2K and take two is, is really focused on is if it's not ready, we don't ship it. Um, so at the end of the day, we're, we're taking that same mantra that has guided the business on PC and console into the mobile business. And we get a lot of insights during soft launch. So, um, yeah, ultimately it's, it's, it's been a huge positive. We're going to see more and more, uh, to come on mobile from 2K and take two. Same question here for you, Michael. I'd love to know, you know, what has launching your games on mobile done for Riot's title? Gladly it's done what we hoped it would do. I think we're still on the very first part of the journey, but there's been what I would call bimodal growth. Um, the first of those is really important to us because it's why we set out to make the game in the first place. Um, there's this there's this group of players who play League of Legends and then can, can, for lack of a better way of putting it, age out of it. And we call them gamer souls with adult responsibilities. It's like League of Legends is a really hardcore, sweaty, competitive game that you have to play sitting in front of your PC for, you know, 35 to 45 minutes at a time or more uninterrupted. And, and that's just a tough format to fit into the like the parts of the day and the phases of life of a lot of our players um, as they as they get older and they play the game. And we aspire for players to play League of Legends for literally decades. Um, uh, we celebrated our 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 10 year anniversary two years ago. Um, and we have a lot of players who have been playing for 10 years. Um, well, now 12. Um, and so we the first thing that's happened um, for us is that we've 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 sort of regrown by a lot of players who um, for whom League of Legends was, you know, was not a was no longer a great fit for for the parts of their day or the phases of their life. Um, the second thing is um, we've grown by what we call this new generation of core gamers. Um, it's like the so like my 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 phone is somewhere between like 130 and 140 times more powerful than my gaming PC was when League of Legends launched, right? And all of our players have this and the new generation of core gamers are are super like grew up grew up with this sort of modality of play. Um, and so uh, I, I think they've always wanted a game like League of Legends um, to play in like sort of in the in sort of the social context that and all of the other gaming contexts that matter to them um and pc just wasn't the right fit it was just you know the same way that that some people play pc and some people play console and not the other there's a lot of i mean it's at, at this point the majority of hardcore gamers on the planet right now are this new generation of core gamers that are dominantly mobile first um and so we've grown by a lot of those players too by giving them what, what we believe is is the deeper experience that they've been looking for um, on their mobile devices. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's largely been that bimodal growth um, for League of Legends broadly. And, and because it's such a powerful community that, it, that experiences network effects in the true sense of that word, which is the more players there are in that community, the more value each player experiences from the community, um, that growth has been incredibly powerful. Um, and so, yeah, we're really excited about that. It, that's just where we are today. Like I said, I, we're in this for the super long term. And so I expect there to be other sort of plurality audiences that, that are going to get in and get involved and get excited and, and also enrich and grow the community. Um, but this is where we are today and we're super happy about it. Yeah, it seems like... Uh almost as if you have a, a difference in the audience for your PC audience versus mobile and uh, mobile is growing here. Yeah, there's an interesting thing where if you're currently playing League PC, you like Wild Rift, but it doesn't like it doesn't solve this existential need that you have. Whereas if you've if you like the last time you played League PC was like a year ago or seven years ago, it's like exactly what you want and it's like your dreams come true. And, and that actually is a really wonderful way to think about, about how to, how to expand your, like as a game developer, how to expand your franchises and make them more timeless so that they can grow with your players over, over time and over the various parts of their lives. So, so yeah, pretty different than, than our current, our current like active player base of League of, League of Legends on PC. Chris, have you uh, seen differences in your uh, players between mobile audience as well as your PC audience? 
Well, it's actually kind of exciting because <laughs> to talk about the effect of mobile, you really have to look at the effect of arena, which is we reminded a lot of people that they loved magic and phones just did that more. So you have people who've played magic for 25, 26 years, or maybe they played a long time ago and they loved it, but it's fallen out of their lives. Sort of like Michael said, how do you stay in people's lives as these lifestyle games? And when arena first launched, there was a huge resurgence in play and a bunch of people played arena and then said, man, I want to collect those cards, right? So that was the first step of that. Now with mobile, we have the next set of people, right? The people who didn't have the time for the PC or their lifestyle, right? Now, if you're a lifestyle game legitimately in 2021, you need to be in somebody's pocket. You need to be out of touch at hand, right? That doesn't mean you have to be the same game necessarily, kind of like what Michael was talking about, but you're in that same spirit, right? You're in that same soul of what's going on. And so for us, our audience is actually surprisingly coherent. There's a lot of people who cross play um, between the two different platforms, but we've seen engagement and populations go through the roof. Like we never expected mobile to be as successful as it was for a game that is as complicated as Magic. And so that's both people coming back to Magic as well as new people picking it up, having been introduced to the card game genre, now going to sort of the, the first and best and oldest and I don't know, most, you know, most played out there and saying, wow, okay, this is what the real deep end of this uh, gaming experience looks like. Tyler, what value does Google Play as a platform provide to you as a developer? Google has been an incredible partner for us. Um, obviously, you're a very data-driven uh, company. So I would say, first off, uh, when we soft launch, uh, first we're doing a tech launch. So Google basically helps us determine how many crash bugs we have. When we go out the door, when we clean that up, we, we test out how are, how are our servers performing, do we have any lag, issues like that. Secondly, I would say the the benchmarking that you guys provide is is incredible. So we get we, working with you, we get benchmarks for whatever genre we are working on for for whatever country we're out in soft launch. So we know if we're you know at par, below par, or we're we're shooting above um, our our weight class, or punching above our weight class, so to speak. And then thirdly, um, to keep it short, I would say uh, being able to test on the storefront. Uh, is also incredibly powerful. AB testing on app icons, um, screenshots, you know, new feature goes out the door, you can roll it out to X percent of the users. And if something goes wrong, you can roll it back, um, you know, do a hot fix, roll it back out to X percent of the users, make sure that it's working as intended before doing a full rollout. So yeah, the, the Google Play platform is incredibly powerful and, it, and it's been um, uh, a, a great, great asset to, to 2K. Um, and, and other game developers in the community. Yeah, and just to double thumbs up all that, uh, really what it came down to for us is it let us do two important things. Uh, one, it let us be on a real global stage. And while it's a pain for developers to have so many different kinds of devices, it's a huge plus for players because there's all sorts of price ranges. There's a lot more people who are able to access it not just because of Google's presence, but because of the range of experience, right? And that lets you as a game developer scale your game and reach more people that way. Uh, and then secondly, very specifically, Arena had been launched for a year or two ahead of time. And so we actually needed to test this with our players because the early adopters were going to be people who were already playing and already in love with what we were doing. And by allowing us to do the, like Tyler and Michael were talking about, have control over the beta environment, be able to actually test it, roll it out early. While we launched in March, right in January, we were able to player test and really get good feedback and it helped us hugely. Uh, and without that, we wouldn't have been able to bring that same level of experience to players when we launched. I'd like to focus the remainder of this session to ask the panel for advice and best practices that they'd offer other developers looking to expand their biggest games from PC and console. Chris, being fairly new to mobile, having launched just uh, in March, with the results and learnings you've learned over the past few months on mobile, what are some things that excite you and Wizards team about the platform going forward? Obviously, continuing to just expand the number of people who play Magic and the ways you can play Magic is probably the most exciting thing for us because we get to keep sort of making this ecosystem live and breathe and expanding in all sorts of different ways and in different types of games. I think mobile also for us means that magic is always with you. Like we've heard stories of people 
playing magic in between rounds of magic, right? Because they're playing on tabletop and then they're playing on their phones, right? That they can meet people and talk about something that before may have been more reserved for that game store or somebody's kitchen table. It's now out there. And so I think mobile and the ability to be everywhere and to play whenever and with whomever you want with direct challenge is changing magic itself. It's moving it from just the collection hobby that you may have done at one point in your life or that dedicated uh, thing for a few very skilled players to be ubiquitous, to be always out there and to be in people's minds and hearts. I mean, the game is always talked about is how deep and complex it is, but it's got rich lore. It has beautiful art and images. I think we make the most fantasy art in the world every year by far, just because of the amount that Wizards makes with Dungeons and Dragons and, and Magic the Gathering. And for Wizards itself, just imagine that this is just the first door to open with Arena, right? There's so much more that Wizards knows now and says, hey, we can bring these decades old IPs and not just make them relevant, but show everybody why they're so beloved. And it gives us just a, a doorway to invite so many more players in than we've ever had before, especially since Wizards itself is just emerging onto the digital stage, right? We've only been doing digital here uh, first party for a few years. And so it's not just mobile that's new, right? It's our entire digital effort and our successes here with Arena, and we're gonna build on them with more games we're launching, uh, just give Wizards this whole new perspective on what kind of entertainment we can provide. Yep, absolutely. Uh, you know, being a Magic fan and having fellow colleagues that are huge fans, I, I can't understate how much we actually love the idea of having it with us when we want, where we want it, right? And that's just true, I think, for all of our experiences here, right? And so, uh, that's why I encourage people, again, to bring what people love to them, and uh, they're going to love it there regardless of platform. Same question, Tyler. I'd love to hear what uh, 2K is most excited about when it comes to the mobile platform going forward. Um, again, back to 5G. I think 5G is probably in second or third inning. Using the baseball analogy right now, it's going to roll out to more and more people, um, which is really exciting for PvP. It has different implications for um, products you can actually bring to market that weren't possible before. The GPUs and the, and the devices and the RAM uh, keep getting more and more powerful on a year-to-year on a -year basis. Um, so I, I think the most exciting thing for me really at this at this point is the, the future we've been dreaming of, of cross-platform um, or having a, a mobile experience where something you do in mobile actually enhances and carries over to what, what's happening in console when you sit down for that hour, two hour long play session and vice versa. Like the future is actually, it's now. Um, and you know the developers that go execute and the publishers that can support those developers to execute uh, and take the right bets are gonna win. Um, I think the next five to 10 years of, of, of kind of the, you know, of, of the, the gaming wars that are happening right now. So it's, a, it's an incredibly exciting time uh, to be making games for mobile. For mobile, Michael, same question here. I, I'd love to hear, you know, what Riot is most excited about as far as mobile as a platform going forward. So we've talked a bit about the audience, the ecosystem. I'll talk a little bit about just the sort of the device itself and the player experience of the device, I think, or the game developer experience of the device as well. Um, you know, as a lifelong, uh, overly, overly hardcore fan of gaming hardware, uh, and over investor in, in gaming hardware, uh, I the smartphone just blows me away as an incredible piece of of gaming hardware. And I, I think to like the the current generation of phones, and probably in the next cycle, it, it it's also going to take another another mini step up. Um, but but in in a place where a lot of other platforms are already kind of plateauing or have plateaued for a while. Um, you kind of have three three things. The first is just computationally, it's amazing. Like the number of transistors, <laughs> the power of systems on a chip, um, the the like the amount of of like raw pixels you're capable of pushing um, for really really smooth gameplay um, is just incredible on these devices. Uh, like I said, I, I think my my phone that I use to play Wild Rift is something like it's over a hundred times more powerful than the than the custom gaming PC that was my PC when, when League of Legends first came out. Um, the second thing is the displays. The displays, inch for inch, pixel for pixel, are the best displays on the planet for gaming. Um, 
and and you just can't we probably aren't going to beat that on other devices for you know at least not 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 in ways that don't cost you way too much money um uh probably won't beat that for like another three to five years um and then the last uh, and tyler had mentioned this is the connectivity i mean like the ability to play games on like on, on true 5G connections or even the range of 5G connections on most phones and most networks right now is just dope. It, it makes competitive level, like professional level competitive play um, accessible pretty much anywhere, anywhere you are. Um, there's, there's just so, so much power to those three things together. I'll say one more thing, which is sort of at the intersection between the device and, and the ecosystem, is that there's this old computer science adage that um, you should never ask, uh, uh, you should, a computer should never ask the user questions that the computer should already know the answers to. Um, and the thing that's pretty amazing about the smartphone, and this is, yeah, the, uh, I just love this way of thinking about it, which comes from a, a guy named Ben Evans. I should, I don't, I cannot possibly take credit for it because this is just the right way to think about it. The thing that's amazing about the smartphone in particular as a piece of gaming hardware is that it fundamentally changes what your gaming PC knows. And, and the most obvious example is it knows who you care about and it knows what they're doing right now. And it makes it really easy for you to get into a game with them in a way like a modality of that game that you both are going to be able to enjoy together. There's really no other platform that offers that kind of unique superpower of what the computer knows. Um, and so, so when you kind of put all of those things together, it's just, it, yeah, it, it enables, it facilitates, it makes possible these impossible dreams. But before were impossible dreams that, that, that had never been realized for players. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I could not agree with all of that more. Um, I think for, you know, all game developers, uh, mobile almost seems like a natural next progression of your business, you know, as you grow out your business. For our final question, I'd like to ask that each of you to share what advice you would give other established or newcomers when it comes to PC and console uh, developers when they're first looking to uh, expand to mobile. The typical advice that I give to most game developers who are coming to mobile for the first time is, is dare to dream. Um, believe in um, the evolution of your game, not just the, the rendition of your game that isn't too much worse uh, than your source material. Believe in, in the evolution of your game that is just better for players, that is just the superior formulation, that is just pure magic. The reception for Wild Rift has been, you know, our articles that that are like, you know, Wild Rift is better than League of Legends in almost every way. Wild Rift isn't some baby version of LOL. It's a new and improved version of League of Legends. Like that, those are the way, like aspire for those kinds of reactions, not from the press. It doesn't actually matter that much, but from the players and like believe in that and chase that vision. Yes, there are going to be some challenges that you're going to face and some compromises that you are going to have to make. Um, if you dare to dream, then you will figure out which are the ones that are important compromises to respect and which are the compromises that are the ones that deserve to be challenged and shattered. Um, because if you chase that vision of just the evolution, just the best version of, of the game, not for all of your players, but for the ones that you're that you're on this particular mission for. Um, if you if you dare to dream and you stay true to that dream and that vision and that why, inevitably, a really robust business will follow. Chris, love to hear what advice you would offer to other developers looking to get into mobile. Yeah, uh, this first one's going to sound a little general, but know why you're doing it. Um, mobile is sort of this like generic answer now like oh we well, got to put it on the phone but you got to know why you're doing it because it matters a lot for each ip and for each game and most importantly for each audience if you have an existing audience out there who likes something or loves something know why you're going there is it to just leverage your ip is it to give them some more of this of what they already have but in more places is it to give them something that's better that that dream that michael talked about or is it to give them something completely new? Because each one of those is going to have a different set of risks and each one's going to require a different men development mentality. So if you're going into the teeth of the competition that's out there, 
Mobile is not just game making, right? Mobile is business making. You can't just make an experience, ship it, and then listen again, right? You're making a live service that is going to be daily updated and tested and adjusted, just like everything else that's on your phone, right? It's not unique to games. Everybody's using data-informed development across all sorts of businesses. And if you don't know why you're there, you will quickly lose track of what the value proposition is for yourself, for your business, and for the players that you have out there. And you'll end up making something that is probably a shadow of what you could have made or what you should have made if you didn't go in there with eyes wide open. Arena is a very different kind of game in a lot of ways because it's a game on your phone more than it's a classic mobile game. You know, the, Michael and Tyler each have their own version of that, and that's because they know why they're there. And especially since mobile dominates people's time now, and you actually have to actively make a decision to go sit down and play someplace else, that is going to be even more important to understand because you have to fine tune to meet that competition and to understand and answer that why that you started off with. I would say first and foremost, uh, you know, don't hire a soccer coach to run a professional NBA basketball team. Uh, it makes for a really funny uh, comedy uh, that I think a lot of people laughed at over over the holidays. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I, I think it's incredibly important to bring in um, experts in, in key areas, uh, analytics, product management, um, folks that can basically help shortcut some of the trials and tribulations because mobile is, like I said, the bar keeps getting higher and higher and higher. And the longer you wait to get in, um, the further other companies who are investing in this are getting ahead. Um, I would say stay focused. Uh, I would say, you know, I think it's really important to be upfront and, and determine how you want to run your team from a management perspective. I really believe in an idea meritocracy. I think top down management, um, isn't the most fun place to work. I think democracies, uh, aren't great either because people aren't taking responsibility, um, for their particular areas. So I think it's really important that when you bring in experts, that you kind of test along the way and you, you check in every few months, hey, is this person still the most believable? Are these still the most believable people on our team in terms of decision making in this one area of development, whether it's analytics, marketing, um, et cetera? And then I would also say, finally, um, take, take multiple shots on goal. Uh, you're going to ha have to do a lot of mar market research before you even start development. Um, even then, it's very, very tough. So take multiple shots on goal with the best development teams, with the best publishing talent you can get um, and, and keep at it. And if your batting average is above the rest of the industry, then you're doing an amazing job. Um, and uh, it's, it's no different than being a hedge fund manager. Your job is to beat the S&P 500. I would say it's, it's the same thing in game development for mobile. Uh, a certain amount of the swings at the plate using the baseball analogy again, you're, you're going to miss but you have to stay committed and you have to keep going at it um, because mo mobile really is, is the future and it's where uh, gaming is growing at the most rapid pace. Those are some inspirational words of wisdom and solid advice by the each of you. Tyler, Chris, Michael, I want to thank the each of you for your time today. I can't wait to see what else 2K, Wizards of the Coast, and Riot Games has coming our way to mobile. I hope this session really inspires other developers looking to embark on their own journey of bringing their biggest and best games from PC and console to mobile. Thank you.